Hey, everybody, it's Chris. If you're a sports fan like me, or you're just a fan of a great story, you got to check out Press Box Access, a sports history podcast hosted by Todd Jones. Todd sits down with fellow sports writers who experienced firsthand some of the biggest sports moments of the past 50 years, and they share some of the stories behind the stories, some of which they've only told to each other. What I personally love are the wild stories that you might not hear so much about on SportsCenter over the years. Like when Indiana-based sports journalist Bob Kravitz recounts the time Bobby Knight showed up naked to an office meeting with him and then banned him from the Hoosiers locker room for the next three years because Bob wrote a story he didn't like. Or when Alexander Wolf tells a story about going out on the town in Chicago with Dennis Rodman and Carmen Electra in the middle of a Bulls playoff series. Or when Dan Wetzel talks about what it was like to be in the media room when Temple basketball coach John Chaney stormed into UMass coach John Calipari's press conference after a game and threatened to kill him. These wild and fun stories, paired with stories about real sports greatness, you know, like the 1970s Steelers being the greatest NFL dynasty ever, or the legendary rivalry between Larry Bird and Magic Johnson, and even the impact of protests for social justice issues in sports, make Pressbox Access a show you should check out. Pressbox Access is part of the Evergreen Podcast family, and it's available all the places you get your pods, and you can also find Pressbox Access on YouTube. Go check it out. With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Yeah, we got three tickets to the Brand Van concert happening this Monday night at the Pacific Palisades. Well, you can all allow in if you uh, want to answer a couple of questions. Uh, mainly what is Todd's favorite cheese? Uh, this week, we're welcoming back a one-hit Thunder favorite. Indie rap sensation Spoh's. He has brought with him the deepest cut we've discussed in ages. Brand Van 3000's Drinking in L.A., a song that soared in Canada but made only a small ripple in the States. Yet, for Spoh's, hailing from Maine where the song's melodies permeated the airwaves, it left an impression on him that remains even decades later. Join us as we give this song a ring-a-ding-ding and decide if more people should have taken a ride in the Brand Van. A mafioso story with a twist A two-world food Joey Luma Here to get your ass out of bed He said I'll explain it on the way But we did nothing One hit is all you need To make the money guaranteed And you can live off royalties Forever And it makes me wonder Is it just a wonder Or is it one hit thunder So Spose, welcome back to the show. Thanks for bringing a song I've never heard of in my life before, but I assumed that the reason why you knew this song and I didn't was because you were closer to Canada than I am. But then I looked at a map as to where Wells, Maine is in comparison to Montreal, and I realized like I'm just as close to Montreal in Pittsburgh as you are. So I don't know how you knew this song. Maybe give us a little explanation. Yeah. Did you get much music in Wells, Maine or something? Wow. There's just so many questions to answer <laughs> in, in that alone. Uh, so first of all, super stoked to be back with you guys. Hell yeah. Uh, and I look forward to doing it again next year with some even more obscure song as you have none left that are yeah, I, that have not been covered. It, it is. I mean, this is noteworthy, suppose. Like, Usually one of us knows the song <laughs> from previously before the guest right. picks it. This is definitely the first time we're both Chris and I are like, I have. And then listening, I was like, maybe I'll hear it and I'll remember it. No. Nothing. Wow. Song is great, though. I will say this song is awesome. But- Thanks. So, uh, so first of all, uh, <laughs> I don't know that my regionality closeness to Montreal has much to do with me knowing this song so much as I think they were signed to Capitol Records. Yeah. 
after it becomes I, this is just from Wikipedia because I'll be honest, I didn't know anything about this band beyond this song, right? Because I never yeah. bought the album, and if you and back in whatever era it was, you didn't, 98, I think, 97? Yeah. yeah you didn't know anything. All you knew about an artist was what you saw on the video or the the music video or, or buying the album. So I know this song because of 94.3 WCYY, which is the, the alt-rock station in my region. Um, and I think you guys probably know all the songs you know because of a station in your area. Yeah. I think we established last time. And so this was a hit. This was like a hit on wow. that on that station around the same time as I want to say like razor blade suitcase era bush and yeah. like you know, like uh the Ixnay on the ombre offspring, you know, era, like the yeah. the darker follow up album I, era. I mean, this had to have been something. Because like I, when I was doing research for it, I found them performing the song live on MTV, and it wasn't like MTV Euro or any like it was MT like American MTV them doing a live performance, and it was side note awesome live. The, so the, I've never seen that. Yeah, look it up. the The girl who sings the hook in this, Stephanie, I believe it's pronounced Morai. She, I mean, she's the the star of this track as far as I'm concerned. Agreed. And then I found a really interesting video on YouTube that was about how, because, like, because it was 1997, Geffen or Capital, whichever record label they were on, actually intentionally kept her off of all of the marketing and promotional material and considered having a white, per, a white woman re-record her chorus and bridge because... Some test group said, "Oh, she sounds too urban to the rest of wow. the song." Wow! Holy and like, shit! And it's like, and that caused like a little bit of a rift between her and the rest of the group. Now they're like all buddy buddy and do shows together again. But that was like to me, it's like you take her out of the song, you barely have a song anymore. Like she is the best part of the song, right? She crushes this hook. And to be honest, my understanding of this band because I, I don't know if I'd ever seen them or whatever. I didn't know if it was a duo. I didn't know if she was the group. I didn't know what it was. But in my in my research leading up to this episode, I've listened to the album. Uh, that this came off of Glee, which I had seen at you know Newbury Comics and like Best Buy and all in in this era, and I recognized the cover. I just never bought it. I didn't know what this group was, and so that and I think the record label probably knew that knows that they're like they people don't know who what, so it's like you could switch out and replace. And when you and as somebody who did have one hit on a big major label. You would have probably done whatever the major label said because your big one hit is the moment. Mm -hmm. Well, so here's something that's really interesting. So this group, uh, Brand Van 3000, actually entered into a contest in Canada to get a record deal. And they tied for first. And then it was decided that they were going to be disqualified because the final round involved a live performance and there was no live band for them. Wow. To bring to the show. So it was like a radio contest up until the final round. And then they're like, wait, you don't have a band? You can't perform. And yeah. from the video that I was watching about the history of this band, they were saying like, it was these two dudes who just were like having fun making these songs. And they would just bring in any musician friends that they had uh, to sing on tracks. And they said like, when they started doing live shows... It could be anywhere from three people on stage to like 15 people on stage. <laughs> like there were times where they would just see a street performer in the city that they were playing and just be like, hey, man, come on stage with us and play <laughs> drums or whatever. Like they wow. just were like a collective, like, let's just make music and the fun of making music together. But that also uh, that ethos also makes it really hard to write a lot of pop songs that people want to play on the radio. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, right, ex right, exactly. And maybe that's why this band will probably only get covered on one hit thunder, you know, or the, <laughs> or the history of Canadian music or whatever. No, that's really interesting. And as I listened to the album, I kind of figured out that like, oh, I, I don't know if you guys know the, this maybe was a better thing to cover on this episode, but do you know the song Since I Left You by the Avalanches? Oh. It's like a 2000. Well, so we actually, we we did a Frontier Psychiatrist as a Halloween episode of by the Avalanches. Okay, yeah. So Frontier yeah. Psychiatrist is what I meant, actually. Yeah. Not the, Obviously, the album's fantastic. Yeah. The whole album since I left you, but um, the vibe I kind of got listening to this Brand Band 3000 album is almost like a. 
another album I would compare it to is like Paul's Boutique by the Beastie yeah. Boys, where it's like a, a Dust Brothers like amalgamation of almost like Odelay also by Beck, where it's like the music is made up of all these different sound collage, little drum breaks and like pieces. A lot of the way the Beastie Boys would would create as well. And I think the difference is uh, a lot of that stuff is very sample based. And this is too, but I think a lot of it is like almost making samples out of whoever they know. Yeah. And when I look at who they opened with at the top of their popularity, that kind of syncs up with what you're talking about because they were opening for groups like Massive Attack, Bjork, Pulp, and Moby. So, like, right. definitely in right. that like sample heavy techno. Usually, trip hop. like trip hop's the word, you know, yeah. it's like that. Pulp's that kind of the odd man out in that list, honestly, but. right? But as, um, <laughs> I mean, to be honest, man, especially you know, and I feel this a little bit today as like a it's a little different today, but in um, in modern music, you know, you kind of are whose Pandora you show up on, or like who <laughs> yes. the relate similar artists are when you listen on Spotify. Like, if I if I tell my like Apple HomePod to play a song, it'll play a song it thinks I like because of that song after. Right. Yeah. You know, and so this, so to be grouped with Massive Attack and Bjork and all these like really dope artists as an opener is the kind of 1997 version of that. And that's great. I think it's probably great for them. It's just, I, I, I just assume they never followed it up. Like their next album's like 2006 or something. Yeah, it took a while. Um, the start of this band, Chris, did you find anything on the start of this band? Because I found this very humorous. Well, there was the guy with the French name, right? Who was like yep. a solo artist. And yeah, James, James DeSalvio, I think it is. No, 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 no. The different. Oh, the other one, uh, EP. No, EP not Bergen? him either. Not him either. Oh. I'm talking about <laughs> Jean Le Loop. Um, oh, yes. It does oh, start with Jean Le Loop. We yeah, oui, oui. <laughs> Je pense que Jean Le Loop. Jean Le Loop. Uh, that's because EP went to help him on his song, and he sung in all French. Um, and well, away. it actually starts even before that. Okay. The beginning of this was that James DeSalvio uh, got a big royalty check for a remix that he had done for another Canadian artist. And he was friends with EP and basically called him up and was like, hey, you want to go to New York and spend the entirety of this check? Okay. Wow. And they just That was John and they just That was the yeah. John LaLoupe song. It was a song called yes. Johnny Go. And uh, yes. And that song went to number one on the Quebec charts. <laughs> blowing it up in Quebec. Yeah, blowing yeah, up but those then Quebec they, charts. <laughs> they just, I guess, partied in New York and taught each other how to use samplers and turntables and started creating what would be like the beginning of this group, but they didn't start making the music until 96 is when they made a list of demos that had drinking in LA on it. The song couch surfer and the song everywhere were all on this like demo that they made. And the story that I heard was actually that they went to South by Southwest in 96, 97 with that demo and that they gave it to Moby and Moby oh, wow. was like, this is awesome. And he passed it on to like the record label that he was signed to at the time. And that's also probably why they got to open for Moby uh. later on down the line. Because you don't get... Moby's not like massive, but 1997, 1998, that's about as massive as Moby was ever he, going to be. In 1997, <laughs> 98, Moby was massive. Moby, yeah, was, I mean, he pick any artist of 98, Jay-Z... You know, uh, uh, I don't know. He did that Gwen Stefani song, Southside, around that time, I right. want to say. Like, yeah, that was right as he was, he, he was not, the star was not going to be any bigger for Moby yeah. than it was at the exact time that they handed him that demo. Well, also, of this whole subgenre we're kind of talking about, which is like a little bit of electro alternative, almost like pre EDM. You know, it was essentially it was in the alternative genre, but we're talking about like Fatboy Slim, the the Chemical Brothers, uh, you know, shit like that. Moby was the star. Moby was yeah. the one. He wasn't the one I wanted to be the one, but <laughs> yeah. he certainly was. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there, he had the Christopher Walken video. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. Fatboy Slim was doing a much better job with videos and songs for sure. But Moby had like. I don't know. Like I liked. I actually liked the more. Oh, you're right. That was a Fat Boy Slim video. Yeah, that you're was right. I was gonna say it was Moby, but Moby was the star. Moby yeah. was the one Eminem was dissing. Yep. <laughs> and Emin, but the thing is, like, I think Moby gave a different. Like Moby, the the best songs from Moby 
are like the songs that I would put on if I was going to meditate for 15 minutes. It's stuff like Natural Blues or Porcelain. Right. Fat Boy Slim is the stuff that, like, if I'm at a party, I want to hear fucking Rockefeller Skank or Praise You or Weapon right. of Choice. Like, or if I'm in a not... shootout, a shootout or a heist, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I want to hear that gangsta, too. gangsta tripping. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But uh, that is to say, I mean, Moby is a Moby. I, I always point out to my ki- my kids because I have a daughter who just turned 15. And I always try to point out because uh, the radio station around here was giving away tickets to see Boys to Men a couple weeks ago. And she's like, who's that? I go, you do not understand. Oh, man. <laughs> what? I was like, Boys to Men for like a certain two year span, like 94 to 96 was one of the biggest artists on earth. Like, yeah. boy, like they definitely were big before that, you know, but they, that two album, I was like, you couldn't escape boys to men massive hit, you know? And I just tried to, they had a, I was like, they had a song with Mariah Carey that was number one for like a record <laughs> number of weeks, you know? Yeah. But just the context of this era, she would have no idea that well, Mo- that's Moby was a huge artist. It's crazy that you have that story because literally on Friday I had an argument with uh, I I do like a once a month movie night at my house and it's a very large age group of people. Some in like their mid twenties will come out and some like in their forties. I'm leaning more towards my forties and Boys to Men came up from two of the people that come that were originally grew up in L.A. and they're they said. Yeah, I think people just care about Boys to Men here because they're from Philly. Like, they weren't really that popular anywhere else. What? And I was like, bullshit. What? I was like, absolute no. total bullshit. That's <laughs> like, crazy yeah. to me. Boys yeah. to Men, I honestly suppose I thought you were going to say, I mean, I would think that even 15 year olds would know all about Boys to Men. They might know I, the songs, but not know the artists. Like, I'm sure if they heard I'll Make Love to You, they'll be like, oh, I've heard this I, in a movie once. I guess to but... me, Boys to Men never went away. <laughs> Boys to Men <laughs> has been part of my life they're soundtrack. They're not. They're playing in Wells, Maine next week. Well, <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. All right. I mean, they're playing in Boston, to their credit. But the, yeah. the um, we're pretty close to Boston. But the, um, yeah, no, I think uh, that genre of legit, I was, I was explaining this too. I was like, the genre of legit R&B, sex slow jam mm-hmm. is not really on hit radio anymore no. like that that genre was huge along it would be like and i was telling lily i was <laughs> i love that genre by the way i Me love too. Like, keith's, keith's <laughs> I was gonna say, that's chris's like deep make, guts oh yeah. my god i was listening to uh you're making me high by tony braxton is one of my favorite songs yeah. ever and uh and I I was playing it, and my daughter was like, "This was on the radio," and I was like, "Yeah, right after like the Spice Girls wannabe, mm-hmm. yeah. like it's like the Re- the the really blow her mind and play her next is too close, too close. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I won't, yeah. I won't. <laughs> Unfortunately, I feel like that's happening in real life. At the dance. So yeah, I just feel like there's a lot in this in this era that kind of gets swept under the rug, and I'm curious about the context of the '90s uh, stars to you know, the, this generation that didn't live through it because it's, you know, you don't know Moby and you don't know Boys to Men was huge and you don't, you know, there's all sorts of artists that maybe fall, you know, by the wayside. So you do know about Tupac and and, and Notorious B.I.G. Mm-hmm. You know, you know about maybe Eminem came, you know about Nirvana. Right. But like, what else do you take away? Spice Girls? Well, even something that was hitting me with this song is even looking at the lyrics. The lyrics are so in a very established 1997 time and place reference point that, like, I think if you played this for any kid, they would not get references like a mafioso story with a twist, a Tu Wong Fu, Julie Julie Nemour hitch. Like, they're not going to know about the movie Tu Wong Fu. I mean, I'm going to be honest, man, and this maybe is something I've realized a lot lately, is I have no idea what people are saying. Like, I never looked up the lyrics to this, never cared to even... (laughs) I did not care what they meant. Like, I sang whatever I thought the approximation of the lyrics was and you know what i do this with like the smashing pumpkins which is my favorite band like i don't know what the hell he's saying sometimes dude i and i don't care i it doesn't really, matter really i really love the song tonight tonight i've said that it's possibly the best song of the entire 90s in my eyes and it was only a couple years ago that i even knew what the words to that song were but i was they, it just gave me a vibe of like I like what this is about without reading the lyrics. Like I can just feel that it's about something special, right? This and is if, not about anything. But spe- this is literally it, it is what it says it's about. It's about getting drunk in LA. I, yeah, I, <laughs> I want to say that 
my first impression of this song, which I do like the hook a lot. The hook's the hook is amazing. The hook's great. <laughs> But the rest of the song is kind of a mess. It's kind of like, <laughs> I, what is going it's on? It's like, like a freestyle. <laughs> it's, like a, it's like a rap freestyle. Well, I was, but you know what drew me to it in this era of trip hop, where it's essentially alternative with singing, but usually with turntable scratching and maybe a drum break, because because a lot of it is informed by the technology of the time. Because this is all pre, really, you can make music on your computer. Yeah. You know, this is all like physical you know devices still at this point but the rapping is what really just if i could make a comparison as to what and I, maybe you guys have done a maybe you guys have done an episode about this song maybe you guys don't even know this song because i don't fucking know if you don't know this song but scooby snacks by fun yes, loving criminals great song we haven't done it yet but that's a great song oh man we should have done that but the uh <laughs> this this will be a double episode then because this is no but that that is the vibe yeah that i always got no. from this is like some some base level rapping Mm-hmm. And and uh, and like a dope hook and a and a and a almost like break beat or not break beat but just like a, a drum break style hip hop song. Well, and I think something that you said that I I guess is worth bringing up again is like yes, this is that period you made the reference earlier to the avalanches and you also made a reference to Paul's boutique and I feel like those are both albums that like if you lose the context of when they made seem way less impressive because like anybody right. with a computer can make Paul's boutique or the avalanches album now, but it's like not in 89 or 97. Like you literally had to have every single one of those records handy and like right. finding the exact part that you want it to sample and loop. And like, I remember watching, I think it's beats life and rhyme. The the documentary about a tribe called quest uh, mm-hmm. that Michael Rappaport made. And he, there's a point where they're talking about how Q-Tip used to make beats as a kid because he didn't have a record player, was that he would literally take a blank cassette tape and it would put it in his double-decker cassette tape and just play the same five seconds of what he wanted to sample over and over again for five straight minutes on a tape and then put that into something and rap over top of it afterwards. And it's like that... That art form is completely gone because now you just like copy, paste, 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 and you've created your loop for I you to wrap I literally just hit the of. button L. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> I just hit L. <laughs> yeah, but, but you know, coming from that era, and, and I mean, I know you guys grew up in it too, it is wild how i mean even just the concept of i was i was i was on another show i was on a radio show i do in the in friday mornings in in maine and um a couple weeks ago it was the uh 25th anniversary of my name is by eminem okay and uh which maybe you guys remember where you were when you heard it to me it was like a while i was i had never heard anything like this in my life you know and uh and i had been listening to hip-hop most of my life and I just remember grabbing my boombox, which was a cassette CD player radio boombox, as most of us probably had in the 90s. And I grabbed a blank cassette that was probably already in there, and I hit play and record, and I put the boombox up to the TV. <laughs> and, yeah. I, and I caught, like, the second verse. Wow. And I brought it on my Walkman <laughs> to school to show my friends through headphones on the way to school. I was like, you got to hear this, you know, and played it for them. But, like, that concept would never exist now you know it's like nobody would they would just literally have a phone in their pocket they hit record or they have the link or whatever yeah they just shazam it and find it on somewhere else like yeah like oh i don't know what this song is all right (laughs) now so the way we consume music like that is is certainly you know way easier and changed but but exactly the 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 point that like the music they were making at that era was really confined to the equipment you know, another mm-hmm. another big album of that style is uh, introducing the DJ Shadow album, which was like a super popular, I don't know, mashup samples album. But like to do the Avalanches album we're talking about, which I think might have been like 2002 or something, but they still had to spend their whole life listening to records to even know the records to have the sa- to yeah. what sa- songs they want to sample they need them in the right. same key um it's similar so- to like um what was the dj swamp put out an album too bex dj put mm. out an album that had like worship uh ring of fire and worship the robots is on it but it's again you're like this is late enough into the 90s and early enough in the 2000s that he still needed to know the reference points that he was going to pull from and build out of right um <laughs> Yeah, shout out DJ Swamp, who did yeah. I did see play with Beck once back in the day. Like, this whole sub-genre was like a little, sp- not like spooky, but a little like, 
uh, almost like at night. You know, is the vibe I got as like a 12, 13 year old. I was like, this is like, oh, this is at night, you know, <laughs> yeah. trip hop. You know, and another song I was thinking of was the the Sneaker Pimps. Um, yes, I love that Six, song. Six Underground, which maybe you guys have covered too. Am I pulling we out all the songs I should have pulled out? You, right you, now? you may be, but you Scooby know what? Snacks, wanna... Six Underground. <laughs> so let me ask you this question, suppose, because we are talking about like how one of the things that maybe didn't help uh, this group is obviously like a pretty wide gap between albums. So it was 1997 Mm. followed by 2001 followed by 2007. Like there's these like four, five, six year gaps in between albums. Um, Now, obviously you're on here also to promote a new album that you recently put out. And I think you've seen both sides of it, right? Like you've seen, you've been there where you can take the time between records to like, tour the record, see what's happening. And now I feel like you're in this other era where it's like, you better be putting out new songs every couple weeks to couple months if you even want to have a chance of staying in people's overall algorithms anymore. Right. Yeah, I mean, um, as when I look at something like that, like their discography where you see, you know, three, six-year gaps, I mean, I just see personal stuff. That's person. Yeah. That's personal life, which would... In these scenarios where you probably had a, a um, essentially a top forty alternative hit or whatever, I'm sure it was some behind the scenes record label stuff, you know, and all sorts of personal stuff. And also, they seem like a group that's more like a a, a loose conglomerate rather than yeah. like a you like know a the band. four of us yeah. in a <laughs> in a room together and, and kind of led by like a dude making beats in his room. But right. also, this genre kind of passed them by pretty quick like by 2001 we were at lincoln park and the strokes and you know <laughs> this this was kind of done but you know what's crazy is even if uh you have like a number one hit or something like still that means like 65 percent of the earth has no idea who you are you oh, know yeah. it's like it's it's a crazy thing but basically the the question you asked is like um do you feel you know the change and you could have a couple years between albums and now do you feel like you got to release stuff constantly and yes, I do feel like that. And I always put it like this. And, and maybe social media isn't the the word for it. Maybe it's just our culture as a whole. But like uh, social media, I always, as a metaphor, say is a river. You know, mm-hmm. imagine like okay. the Mississippi River. And you're <laughs> standing, and you and, and the three of us are standing right here on the bank, maybe like 20 feet apart with everybody else all down the river, you know, yeah. for thousands and thousands of miles and and you really only see your little spot in the river right Mm -hmm. and if i want to make a splash and make anybody notice i throw the i make the best biggest thing i can possibly do and maybe i don't know what's big at the time you know when you throw it in the river and everybody's like whoa and then what happens three seconds later it is gone Right. Yeah, someone else throws in an even bigger rock into Look the at river. that, you know. <laughs> I mean, Whoa, look at Sometimes I threw something in and somebody else threw something even. And then there was, for example, like a mass shooting that day. And you're like, whoa, that's a bigger splash. I got to look at that. You know, yeah. and, it, and so the attention span and the sheer, um, I mean, if you turn your, if you put Instagram sideways or Facebook sideways and you swipe it. On the on the you know horizontally on a table, it is a river. That's what you I know, was gonna say. That's it's liter- yeah. literally what it is. You could work on something for months, and it could be you or I or Matt could could just have that thing come up, and we could give it three seconds and be like swipe, right? <laughs> swipe. <Yeah. laughs> you know, Even like, if it, you liked it, yeah, yeah. Right. You know, you're on to the and it's and so you really have this very fleeting, finite thing, but. The one thing I will say that's um, a positive change I've I've noticed maybe even since my last album, which was 2001, before this one I just put out. You mean 2021, right? It has 2020. Been th- I- it has been 23 <laughs> years since the last album. Yeah, correct. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I did put out an album in 2001, but I'd get canceled if if we heard it. Yes, 2021. Sorry, I put out this album, Get Rich or Die Ryan, and I and I and I think the only positive real change for artists because there's been a lot of negative ones your whole catalog is now in play yeah like not just the most recent thing you made which which does present you more opportunities to throw things in the river because it is because you know say for example i don't know what's a good example like my my song nobody from my album my 2015 album is like one of my more popular songs 
but you know, it maybe has like 2.5 million views on YouTube. And that is to say that most of the Earth's population has never heard of it whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. So mm -hmm. I can repurpose a verse of that or, or a clip of the video and post it tomorrow, and maybe that's the first time you ever see it. And, sure. if, I, and if you don't th keep throwing things in the river, including the stuff that you've made in the past, which I guess, in, I guess my point is in the entire history of the music industry, except for a Greatest Hits album, there was never a way to say, hey, look at my old stuff too. Yeah. You know, that this was good. I think that's just the model of the record industry is, hey, the new thing. Right. Yeah. It benefits people who are prolific now. Yes. And that's a good hmm. thing. That's a good thing. How powerful is Cox Internet? Powerful enough to let your band members in Vegas, Phoenix, and Rhode Island Jam like you're all in the same garage. Get Cox Internet powered by fiber with America's fastest download speeds. It's Internet built for tomorrow, today. Cox, always building better. Cox Internet is connected to the premises via coaxial connection. Speeds vary and are not guaranteed. Cox terms and other restrictions may apply. Analysis by Ookla speed test intelligence data. Fixed median download speeds. USQ3 2023. I'm not going to lie here. I've become a factor fanatic lately. I'm a busy guy and getting to eat restaurant quality meals that are ready to heat and eat in two minutes has been amazing. Eating better is easy with Factor's delicious, ready-to-eat meals. Every fresh, never-frozen meal is chef-crafted, dietitian approved and ready to go in just two minutes. You have 35 different options to choose from every week, including Calorie Smart, Protein Plus, and Keto. And also, there are more than 60 add-ons to help you stay fueled up and feeling good all day long. I've been spreading the word to everyone I know, not just here on the podcast, but in person as well. Factor is the perfect solution if you're looking for fast, premium options with no cooking required. You get as much or as little as you need by choosing your meals every week. Plus, you can pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. And the math doesn't lie. Factor is less expensive than takeout. Plus, considering every meal is dietitian approved, it's also nutritious and delicious. So what are you waiting for? Get started today by heading to factormeals.com slash one hit 50 and use the code one hit 50 to get 50% off. That's code one hit 50. The words one hit and the number 50 that is at factormeals.com slash one hit 50 to get 50% off. Put down that smartphone and listen to me. I'm Matthew Milligan, professional musician and lifelong Weird Al fan. Each week, I'm joined by professional podcaster and close personal friend Matt Kelly to take a dive off the deep end into the vast career of pop culture icon Weird Al Yankovic on our show, Weird Algorithm. Along with some very special guests from the worlds of music and comedy, we tackle every song, every television appearance, and every bit of sketch comedy Al has produced in chronological order, covering the good old days of My Bologna and Eat It, the fun zone of tacky and white and nerdy, and everything in between. As we go, we're ranking the songs, albums, and music videos in the hopes of creating the ultimate guide to a career bigger than the biggest ball of twine in Minnesota. So the next time you're having one of those days stuck in a traffic jam wondering why does this always happen to me, just kick off your sneakers and stick around for a while because we've got it all on Weird Algorithm, available wherever you get your podcasts. And now you know. Was that enough references? If I could give you another example of the the gift and the curse of this, though, is um, James Blake, the um, yeah, kind of like ethereal keyboardist singer, um, kind of went on a rant. I, don't, I hate to call it a rant. He he had a monologue on X Twitter, yeah, uh, whatever okay. Twitter's called, uh, yesterday, <laughs> and he said something. A lot, he was talking about TikTok and he was talking about Spotify and basically that the music industry's broken. Um, and he goes. Remember when my Godspeed cover went vial, viral? I think it was a cover of a Frank Ocean song. He goes, neither me nor Frank Ocean ever made a cent because it was an orig quote unquote original sound in every video. Oh. As in, it never was like Godspeed cover by Frank Ocean right. or by, by, by James Blake of Frank Ocean. It just says original sound. Right. And so not only did they not make money off it, the average whatever teenage girl who might have been a fan of that sound or that that sound that song doesn't even know it's who made really, it. yeah you're right you that sound saying? is the right way to put that that <laughs> sound she's a fan of that sound she's not even a fan of that song <laughs> it's the 11 seconds of the song that the sound and so that is to say 
you can have a gigantic viral moment. Like I could have these this chorus of one of my songs become like a viral thing that everyone's but everyone in the world is posting but unless they tagged me Mm -hmm. and the song you don't even really know what it is and so you can have these viral moments that don't even translate to yeah a a, a bigger a bigger moment or the catalog research that you talked about yeah right so there's a sound that i'm a fan of on tiktok yes a sound that people use a lot, a lot of times. And uh, it's when I first signed on the TikTok, it was one of the first things I became a fan of a few years ago. And it's used a lot when they show like a picture of a cat looking real cute and like coming around the corner or something. But it's this song that goes, here comes the boy. Hello, boy. It's like a song. I don't know who sings it. It's, it's like a pretty good like 15 second clip, but it's exactly what you're saying. And you saying, I don't know who sings it is exactly it. You know, yeah, it's like, you right. don't know. So, so yeah, that it's definitely a, a and so to circle back to your to your question, yeah. who the fuck knows what to do as far as how much you need to put stuff out? But I do think the small positive of this decreasing attention span, social media is a river concept is that everything you've ever made is back in play. Yeah. Yeah. I like and honestly, that. what could go wrong? What could go yeah. wrong, man? Yeah. <laughs> That's the album. If, yeah. you, if you Google it, yeah. if you were to Google it, you would see that that is a Spose album. But yeah. who's going to put hey, in that effort? Spose, I was going to ask you, I, I want to talk about Brand Van or AKA BV, BV3. BV3K. How, yeah, Great yeah, abbreviation. B- Love sounds it. Sounds like a boy band. B- yeah. BV3. They call themselves BV3. Um, <laughs> Bef- bef- when we were coming into this episode, and I wasn't familiar with Brand Van 3000, but then I listened to it. Then I listened to your new album, mm, and I was you. thinking to myself, wow, is this an influence on Spose? I guess they really weren't. You you kind of only knew <laughs> this song, too. But I could see there's a sort of eclecticness uh, within you know the BV3 album. And then when I listened to your album, I'm like, maybe this was an early influence for him. Because, uh, hey, man, I got to tell you. I really like your album. Today's the first oh, time. Thank you. I got, I got you sent the advance over. Uh, I got a. I guess what, by the time this is out, your album's already out. Is that yes, right? Yeah. Cor- okay. Correct. But I sent you <laughs> guys the the early SoundCloud advance link. Yeah. 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 It's great, and I had some things to tell you about it. Now, anyone Please. out there, go check it out. What could go wrong from Spose? Hey, Matt and I both love the opening track. No complaints. Oh, thank you. It's yeah. rocking, rocking. That's uh, my big pumpkins influence there, or maybe see, the. I said Weezer. I thought the guitar tone has a Weezer sound to it. Almost. Sure, I'll take that. Oh, the, <laughs> I, I, the heavy Weezer for sure. I, and I thank you. I really appreciate that because that that I wanted to come out the gate with that vibe and establish that like this is honestly. I feel like that song's the closest I've ever got to like the center of the Spose box, which is this kind of alt rock with with lyricism bars. No, well, right, you know. I mean, I think this is kind of like a, a little bit of behind the scenes, and you might not even necessarily know this, suppose, but the first time I ever had an interaction with you on the internet, bringing it back to like what we were talking about with like knowing reference points, it was when Self Help first came out. Oh, okay. You, yeah. re- you released the single for Self Help, and I, I think at that time I was still on Twitter, and I tweeted at you and said... Is the ending of this inspired by Salvation by Cranberries? I love that because it had that banana banana, and you were like, "Dude, how do you know that?" So like, it was yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Is, like, like, and ever since we've kind of stayed in touch, and I was able to get you on the show like a year or two after that. But sometimes it's like that that hidden language of like knowing what people's reference points are helps like build that communication better because you're like okay this person knows this point of contact so i know i can have a conversation for longer than five minutes with this person just solely based on they know what the hell i'm talking about right Right, now i'm not talking over their head you knowing salvation by the cranberries is a hint that oh maybe we have a lot more in common than that if you're there for the the kind of like what, that song was cut. not zombie, yeah. you know. That, <laughs> it's not, not like dreams. It's not linger. It's not, yeah. Right, it was like right. the last noteworthy radio single they ever had. Right, but, but I I think I probably said this to you at the time, but I listen to that song all the time. I put that. Yeah. That's one of my favorite songs. So yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> that song uh, fucking rips. But um, suppose speaking yeah. of songs that rip, 
15 years was Ooh, shaking years. my whole was oh. shaking my whole room that sub bass in that song <laughs> fucking sick uh dude i don't know if the way that you're releasing this album if you have in quotes a single is but if you do is floor the single oh man good question so uh, floor is absolutely, you know what? I, is, this is some behind the scenes baseball, but basically, I've released three singles leading up to this, and I wanted to release another one the week before the album mm-hmm. dropped. But for some reason, there's something with Spotify where if I release the single within seven days of the album, the single won't ever show up in anybody's email, just mm. the album. And so it's okay. more important for me that the album shows up, but Floor is supposed to be that right before the album single because that okay. song is big yeah i love Feels that big. song love that i mean i was just really impressed with how you know eclectic i'll use that word again the, yeah. the album is i that the synth poppiness of that song make it out alive i thought was awesome mm. i thought and bright I, side was really awesome and i gotta shout out blankets Blanket is fucking awesome too. Blanket Thank was you. one of the ones where I like because I had it on while I was like making lunch before we record it, and Blanket was one where I like stopped and was like, I need to write down what the song title is. <laughs> nice, yeah. and in that one, I will say Weezer is definitely a jumping off point that, for that. But to to circle back to your earlier point, man, about um, if you know something like Brand Van Three Thousand would uh, inform the eclecticness of this album. Obviously, I didn't know the Brand Van album, but listening to it. It clearly is very diverse, but I do think growing up listening to things like the Beastie Boys, growing up, even even if you go listen to a Smashing Pumpkins album, which I, is my main influence growing up, is like, you know, there's like four or five different genres of rock music yeah. on every Pumpkins album. The simple answer is we all grew up in the 90s, so we love this. Yeah, <laughs> we love yeah, that. Okay, we're, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so does most of the people who listen to One Hit Thunder. So yeah, right. if you're anyway. listening to this podcast, you're most likely a 90s fanboy, and uh, Spose might be your new favorite rapper, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> well, yeah. I do think it appeals to, you know, it's, it's really, and as I get older, I get closer and closer and closer to artistically being. 10 year old me <laughs> if that, I, I mean that in like the, the best way possible like I am purely my influences and purely like unafraid to say what genuinely I feel you know and I think on this record uh musically as well you know I think uh and there even if you get to the end towards the end there is some you know uh uh chemical brothers type break beats on any mm-hmm. minute and yeah. and um yeah. you know some like um you know a gu- guitar with like a harmonic on it you know that l- opens and closes the album and like it's yeah i heard some acoustic guitars on yep. here yep. i heard i heard all all kind of stuff it i, I also love man. that you you pulled a uh, a taylor swift deluxe edition trick of just having a voice memo of you hashing out one of the tracks in As the middle a song. of the album. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and that comes from my friend Ben's Been Dead, who is featured on Make It Out Alive and um, uh, uh, Bright Side. He kind of sat down with me because I, I really had made this album in almost real time as I was going through divorce from my mm-hmm. wife. And so I was, you know, I started this album before, before anything went wrong. And then we find out what could go wrong and I go through <laughs> wow. it kind of in real time. Um, wow. And so the album is mostly in chronological order from when I started, when I made it, and when I finished it. Wow. Whoa. And so my friend Ben had pointed out as we're listening to maybe 20 or 30 demos that are, you know, tracks I'd made. Um, and some of it were like, no, that's too deep. That's too personal. Don't put that out. Or, or that's, that just doesn't fit the vibe. He kind of like executive produced, I guess, in a way. That song, the voice memo song, he go because I had a fully produced version of that with like a full band, and he goes, "Man, the voicemail, de- the voice memo demo of that is raw as hell. Like yeah, that yeah. would be crazy if you just put that on there." So shout out to Ben for that encouragement to just put basically me playing a guitar, singing yeah. that demo from a raw personal place. But um, yeah, thanks, man. And I think eclectically, yeah, I do think it covers all these new spaces and you talked about self-help earlier, which I was happy to put out a few years ago to expand the box of what you think Spose could be to this punk rock tempo (laughs) aggression thing. And I think on this album, having already established that I'm like, all right, I feel safe in all these genres in a way. 
Um, I do have to ask before we wrap this up, is there going to be a tour coming up soon to promote the new album? Yes, I'm announcing it in like sections and uh, the first I think by the time people hear this, the first section will be announced. So you could go to supposemusic.com and look at those dates. But I'm um, definitely trying to do the whole country throughout the year and go play go play these records and, and you know, and the quote unquote hits and uh, get back to I, I haven't been on tour since 2022. So, yeah, I'll be stoked. Well, I can I can. uh Say that I've only seen Spose once, and it was probably I would I'm willing to guess it was during one of the most uncomfortable sets you've ever played in your entire life, uh, and you still killed it. So I can't wait to see good to see yeah, even hope you more. Come to a good one. Yeah, yeah the, uh... I saw you play. Do you remember when you had to play the too many games video oh my game God, convention? Top... <laughs> Yo, I've read. <laughs> so this is real. Yeah, I fucking do. <laughs> I fucking do. <laughs> I sent the meanest email ever after that show. <laughs> I was so pissed. Entirely not worth it. I wish I could have that the weekend it was, back. It was um, a hell of a show. I bought every shirt that you had available in your merch table at that show. But well, you're uh, appreciated. The sound yeah. guy, no. And yeah, the, no. And that the was festival. a wild. That was in Chris to give you some uh, <laughs> to give you a view of what was happening here. It was literally a family-friendly video game convention, okay. and it was like right before him, like our buddy Mega Ran went on and like did a great job, and Mega Ran's got that whole video game thing happening. And I went because obviously I'm friends with Mega Ran, but I love Spose. So I was like, I can finally see Spose live, and I think he hit the stage. And what I what would you say like halfway through it you realized I say fuck a lot in these songs where there's just yeah. a gang of children in the front row and like, like my <laughs> wife at the time and like our kids are all there because I was like oh we'll go to Philly for like a little trip you know and, but the main thing I remember is the the sound guy kept interrupting the show oh. because of his equipment which was janky yeah and Sheesh. broken like he had a mic stand that would not stay up and so i was like reefing on it and i think i like dropped it at one point because it's like this is a piece of shit from <laughs> 10 years ago and he stops he comes on the mic like in the monitors and like starts oh. yelling at me in the middle of the show oh it was awful <laughs> oh, it was yeah. killing me <laughs> yeah no it was <laughs> that's it was, horrible it was, but i was <laughs> in the front row pushing those kids over singing along to knocking on wood like my man like... <laughs> my man it was like curb your enthusiasm i always <laughs> yeah. i always talk about this hypothetical if i ever have the time or the energy to to write like a hbo series about being a touring musician called vanimals nobody steal this please and, uh, <laughs> basically each each episode is a city that episode would be like whatever town outside of philly that's called <laughs> Duh. it says it on the screen in text and i mean that's a hell of an opening that's his first episode opening is that oh show. i've got way better than that but yeah we <laughs> i mean essentially the show you never see us perform because all the drama of the day is everything else <laughs> maybe that show you'd see part of the performance but it's like it's like a band that you never hear in the show you know yeah, and so, it's because it's uh what's it the band from can't hardly wait uh love burger just love, love burger. burger. You never, you never hear a song by the band. Right, exactly. I've, I've had plenty of these. I, I, I've once played at a gazebo in Mississippi in a swarm, of, in a swarm of mosquitoes. <laughs> yes, I, yes. So I've been, I've been to all it. these shows. I think anybody uh, who's been a touring musician for as long as both you have, there are you just yeah. have war stories to share. Of like, you really do. <laughs> I mean, I could, I could go off. I mean, just I know we're trying to get out of here, but. I have, for example, there's one episode that would be just Salt Lake City, and <laughs> it starts in Salt Lake City, but by the by, like ten minutes in, it's Logan, Utah, because they moved the show from Salt Lake City to Logan, Utah, and we're like, all right, and then they move it from the venue in Logan, Utah, to the what I thought was a club called like Eagles Club. No, it's just the Eagles Club. Like where the where old people right. go to drink and nobody told them we were coming there to play a show. <laughs> Sound equipment, none. You know, it's like everything just went. And then when the promoter realized that, like, oh, I really screwed this up, and like, I owe Spose actually like twenty five hundred dollars right now. He disappeared. 
We oh, couldn't find him, so <laughs> we had to drive back to Salt Lake City and stand outside his office the next morning, like to shake him down for like <laughs> the money. So yeah, touring touring sucks. Hey. <laughs> suppose, you, suppose you would really enjoy if you go on YouTube, look up the the singer from Green Jello, uh, hunting down a promoter who stiffed him, finding him, and then <gasps> humiliating him on camera for like twenty <laughs> minutes straight. That guy's that guy's wild. You would enjoy that video. I, uh, I'm typing it in right now. So yeah, that yeah. I but, forget. Uh, before before we wrap up, I do have like some brand van <laughs> brand van three thousand. Uh, Things to talk about with you guys pretty quick. The, apparently, Brand Van was the 131st biggest band in Canada from 1996 to 2006. Who that is, ranks that? Well, I'll tell you. It was based on... So, in 2017, Nielsen and Billboard, in honor of 150 years of Canada existing, <laughs> they were figuring out who were the 150 biggest bands and artists from Canada of all time um, based on the data they had, which was sound scan and digital from the years 1996 to 2016. So based on that, they were 131. Now, I had a little game for you guys to see. Do you know who number one would be? Who the number one artist? Yes. I got Okay, you go with your answer, and I think I have another one if you are This is wrong. the number okay. one Canadian artist? The number one Canadian artist of all time, based on data between 1996 and 2016. Physical and digital sales, according to Nielsen and Billboard. Oh, to Who 2016? Would it be? Yeah. 96 to 2016. The I, number I, was real, I was real confident, and now I'm not. Uh, Celine Dion is who I was going to say. Is that who you're going with? Who are you going with, Matt? Well, at first I thought you were saying band, like specifically a band, which I think it would be Bare Naked Ladies. But I band think or artist, band or artist. I feel like Justin Bieber, right? He's Canadian, and can that I would have been one like other his prime guess? time. Uh, <laughs> suppose say, don't say don't say another guess oh, because okay. you because you got it. Yes, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell Let's you go. in order if you want to know. Now, Matt, Shania been, Twain has to be Shania there. Twain was number two. Yeah, That's good oh. job. I didn't uh, know Matt, Shania Twain was Canadian. God damn. Yeah. That's, Matt, what I'm, if, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> Matt, if you would have said band, you would have still been wrong because the biggest band. The Tragically uh, Hip. You got it. God damn, yeah. Spose. What can't I do? <laughs> how, are you, how are you this good at this? But, I, I just uh, live in Maine, very close to Canada, I guess. Okay. All right. Well, the list was Celine Dion was one, Shania Twain two, Buble three. Oh, yeah. Oh, Michael. Yeah. Uh, Tragically Hip four, Sarah McLaughlin five. Nickelback six, Diana Krall. I don't know who that is. Seven, yeah. Avril Lavigne eight, Our Lady Peace nine, Brian Adams ten, Justin Bieber was eleven. Damn, that's it went, crazy to me, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> then it went Leonard Cohen, Neil Young, Blue Rodeo, Bare Naked Ladies. Finally down here at like fifteen. Wow. Yeah. And and then here's what something that's really surprising to me. Then it was Great Big C, Johnny Reed. Don't know who either of them are. Then. Alanis Morissette, all the way at 18. No way. So let me ask a question, It's because Jagged Little Pill came out in 95. That may have been it. (laughs) Well, I was also going to ask, I'm wondering if that was confined within Canadian sales versus like American crossover, because I wonder if like Justin Bieber is one of those artists that's bigger in America than he is in Canada or something. Probably. You know what I mean? Like, probably. Because I think just based on sales alone during the time period where 2016 is involved like Bieber was inescapable for yeah. like a decade there <laughs> like, I just think the the reasons it's Celine Dion and Shania Twain are the sales in the 90s of CDs were way more right. substantial than any number of people num- any number of times someone bought the single baby by Justin Bieber yeah you know, yeah. you're buying twelve. You're buying all twelve Celine Dion songs. That's you, that's fair. You guys ready to <laughs> test your wits one more time? Oh Let's boy, go. okay. I'm here ready we go. to win again. You, yeah, I think you might. Here we go. Brand Van Three Thousand is from Montreal. Name another band from Montreal. I'll tell you this: there are, I have seven listed here that you probably know. I mean, the Arcade Fire. You got it. Wow. Right. Okay. Well, Good go. job. <laughs> Matt, would you have gotten any? 
No. My brain was falling apart, and all I was thinking of was the band of Montreal. <laughs> they are like, one of them. They, they are, are one of them. them. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that that was like what an ironic an American band name. Band name. <laughs> uh, there's another broken social scene is maybe from there. Oh, one of are those, they? One of those pitchforky type of bands. I'm Let me I check. Don't, but I didn't definitely see the Arcade them, Fire. The other bands that I was that would have counted here were Godspeed, You Black Emperor, um, Wolf Parade, Simple Plan Damn. of Montreal, Men Without Hats, and Chromio. Oh, damn. All Montreal fire. fire coming out of Montreal. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's the, great. The, the one more question I have for you, too. Brand Van 3000 were part of the Horde Tour 98. That's H O R D E, the Horde oh, Tour. Oh, God. We went over this already. <laughs> <laughs> Name two other. Bands or artists that played at the Horde Tour in 1998. The Squirrel Nut Zippers. Oh, no. No, they did not um, play that year. That's a oh good man. guess. I'm going to throw, because I think we talked about them on this episode, Rusted Root. Was Rusted Root on the Horde Tour? They were not on that Horde Tour. <laughs> the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones. No. I nope. remember the Horde Tour. 311, I feel like, was on the Horde Tour at one point. Not this year. Um, not 1998. <sighs> All right, hit me. Um, I'm going to throw one more out there. Indigo Girls? No, no. Okay. They were probably on Lilith Fair. Uh, the Horde Tour 98 featured Blues Traveler, Oof. Bare Naked Ladies, Ben Harper and the Innocent Criminals, Alana Davis, Cherry Pop and Daddies. That's oh, you I, were so That's close. what I was going for. <laughs> worst, worst, worst band name ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Cowboy Mouth, Fastball, Galactic, Government Mule, Huffamoose, Matt, our boys Hell Huffamoose. Hell yeah, our boys Huffamoose. <laughs> uh, Marcy Playground, Paula Cole, and Spose, come on, man, the Smashing Pumpkins. No. Yeah? <laughs> Smashing Pumpkins were. are the only cool band on that list. <laughs> oh, I disagree. <laughs> oh, Matt, don't, don't say anything bad about Bare Naked Ladies Yeah, I Matt. love BNL, man. They're, <laughs> what it's I'm just the about. least sexy list of musicians I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah, it was not. It was Horde Tour would not have been where I was at. Oh, one more for you guys. Brand Van 3000 released Drinking in LA in February of 1997. The 39th Grammys also happened in February of 1997, where this female artist won Album of the Year for her album, Falling Into You. Oh, I know this. Buzzing in. Celine Dion. That's yeah, that's right off. That's off. <laughs> I, you, Celine Dion was the answer to two of my questions yeah. I had for you well, guys. Finally, Celine I was, I was sitting there thinking, 1997, that's 100% the Grammys when yeah, my heart will go on was like blowing up. So That's <laughs> Titanic. Hey, one last thing that I thought was really interesting about BV3, as I like to call them. <laughs> in the, their second album in 2001, Discosis, the single from that album, which is pretty awesome, called Astounded, it yeah. was the final recorded performance of Curtis Mayfield yeah, before he died. What? And, yeah. It's, it, Curtis Mayfield sings the whole thing. I was waiting for someone else. It's basically just a Curtis Mayfield song. Uh, it Amazing. became the most successful Canadian single from BV3. This was bigger. This astounded song was bigger than Drinking in L.A. It wow. reached number three on the Canadian singles chart. For anyone who doesn't know who Curtis Mayfield is out there, he sings Move On Up. If you don't know Move On Up, it's the song that's sampled in Kanye's Touch the Sky. That's yes. yeah. That's Curtis Mayfield. That's kind of interesting. The song just straight up sounds like a Curtis Mayfield song. Um, but I guess we're at that point in the show where we decide. BV3, did they bring the one-hit thunder or was it a one-hit blunder? I, d I don't know. I think they brought the thunder on this song. I think it's a really cool song. I think it's just uh, maybe like a record label conundrum to figure out what to do with a band like that. Um, mm -hmm. And I can't wait to hear Astounded. But I'd say uh, uh, not a blunder for me. All right. Okay. Uh I'm I'm kind of torn because you know, I like to look at it through like two different lenses of like should this band have been much bigger and like are there a bunch of other songs by them that you should check out? And and it's like are there a bunch of other songs you should check out? I actually think yes. I enjoyed listening to the album Glee and I enjoyed the Curtis Mayweather song that you were talking about. May failed. May whatever. <laughs> uh that you were talking about er earlier, 
But the reverse of that is, should they have been bigger? I'm also kind of like, not really. Like, like they didn't have like <laughs> they, they didn't have like marketable bigger. songs to put on the radio. I just like weird shit, and they made some cool weird shit. So I'm gonna say Thunder, but it's a very gentle Thunder. Like you should check out the album Glee and listen to it. It's, it's Thunder really in the distance. Yes, yeah, yeah it's <laughs> rumbling it's a drizzle. out there. Drizzling. <laughs> So, Chris, uh, is, it, is it a full-blown certification? Do we have to get an envelope ready? <laughs> this is a really hard one for me because we're talking about one hit thunder, and I don't even know that this band had one hit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of... Fair. I, I fair. think that that's a strike against them, being that I don't <laughs> know this song. I mean, the music video does have 4.6 million views, so it seems like a lot of people know it. I most definitely did not. I think... The song is cool. I do think a couple other songs are cool. I think it's kind of a mess. Like, there's not like a real signature sound to this band. And Mm. it seems like a collective of people contributing different things. And for what it is, it achieved a certain level of success. And I think that's cool for them. Should it have had more? I I don't really. I think they had all the success they were going to get from BV3. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. It went above and beyond. I mean, I didn't even buy the album. So, (laughs) right, right. (laughs) And and I don't, I, I don't know. It peaked at number 35 on Canada's RPM top singles. Oh, real quick quiz for you guys before I say Thunder or Blunder. It peaked at number 35 on Canada's RPM top singles, which I guess is kind of like their billboard or whatever in a certain way, um, on July 28th of 1997, what do you think the number one song was on the RPM charts at that time? What was the date? July 28th, 1997. If you get this, I will be so impressed. I'm going to go one week by the Bare Naked Ladies. Damn it, that was what I was going to go with. Um, Okay, well then, uh, I'm going to steal your Celine Dion answers all the time and say, (laughs) it's all coming back to me now by Celine Dion. (laughs) No, no. Uh, I think Spose was a little bit closer. It was actually The Difference by The Wallflowers. What a song. (laughs) <laughs> that's a good ass song yeah so when the difference was number Wouldn't one in canada that. This, <laughs> this was number 35 uh sorry i can't make this a certified thunder i gotta go blunder that's all right international one. shipping for that certification to canada would have killed us so yeah yeah i would have hor- <laughs> i would have kayaked it over the border uh, yeah. <laughs> the social uh, media river uh but hey suppose thanks for coming back man it's really awesome talking music with you and i want to really reinforce Go check out Spose's new album, What Could Go Wrong. It's awesome. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. I really appreciate you checking out the album and the the love and for having me back on. I feel like the floor beneath me fell out and I hope I'm dreaming. When I wake up, I'm still in the dark. Mm -hmm. Losing us, because I got nothing to lose. A hundred bucks, so it's not even 100 proof can make me numb. What have we become? Grab me, babe, I'm falling into the abyss Cause you were always my nest So when I slip, you were waiting to catch But there's a catch, there's a catch, there's a catch There's a drop, there's a fall, yeah, once and for all this has been One Hit Thunder. One Hit Thunder is hosted by Chris Ophelios of the band Punchline and produced by Matt Kelly of Geekscape.net. Underneath me, you're hearing Floor by this week's guest, Sposed. Find it on his new album, what could go wrong? Our podcast is on Patreon now. Find us at patreon.com backslash OHT podcast for early access to episodes, bonus episodes, and a chance to vote on future songs for us to cover. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to us on any podcasting app. And tune in next week for more One Hit Thunder. Feet in the air and I can't find no solid ground. So there I go, there I go, falling right through your ghost. Where's the road? Get the road. Stuck in my throat, my heart is shredded into confetti. I'm outside as you throw the party. I feel like the floor beneath me fell out in a hole. I'm dreaming when I wake up, I'm still in the dark. Take me by the hand, pull me out the dark. I feel like the 
Zero Foxtrot isn't just a brand, it's a way of life. Founded and operated by veterans, Zero Foxtrot's unique apparel and gear echoes the grit of the warrior culture. Zero Foxtrot dedicates itself to producing content, honoring the sacrifices of forgotten heroes of the past, and connecting history to the present. Embark on a journey with Zero Foxtrot today at ZeroFoxtrot.com. It's not merely our products. It's about the ethos that we embody. Rugged, resilient, and timeless. Hi, this is Paul Phelps. And this is Monica Strutt. And we're from the Daily Music Business Podcast. We're joined by a number of other really great hosts in creating daily content with great advice for independent musicians just like you. That's right. We put out episodes daily on all topics from music marketing to branding, advice on signing with a manager and label and anything else you need to up-level the business side of your music career. We've got it covered. Subscribe to the Daily Music Business Podcast today on your favorite podcast catcher. Subscribe today to the Daily Music Business Podcast on your favorite podcast platform.